Thank you everyone for joining us tonight for our panel discussion, Hampton's 20th Century Modern, presented by the Amagansett Free Library and the East Hampton Historical Society. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Lux Interiors and Design. My name is Marianne Delacroce and I'm the Director of Visitor Experience with the East Hampton Historical Society. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome our panelists and guests this evening. And I would first like to introduce Jacqueline Marks, archivist with the Amagansett Free Library to tell us about this program tonight. Jackie. Thank you each and every one of you for being here. And thank you to our sponsors, Lux Interiors and Design and East Hampton Historical Society. We would like to express gratitude to our talented panel of experts from both coasts for giving so freely of their time to be with us tonight. I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge Timothy Godbold for his ongoing efforts to have the Hamptons modernist houses designated as landmarks. A native Australian, Tim has been living here for almost a decade now. He's spent his life in design in the fields of fashion and interiors. Tim's father was an architect and instilled in him a passion for architecture preservation and a love of modernism. Thank you, Thank you Tim for your courage and your perseverance. I believe that tonight is only the first step towards accomplishing what you set out to do, to save these modernist gems, some of which are visible on our screens right now from destruction. And now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to our moderator, Grace Buley Hunt. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you, Marianne, and hello to everybody joining us this evening. Uh, once again, I'd like to welcome you to Hampton's 20th Century Modern, preserving our architectural <laughs> history. Uh, my name is Grace Buley Hunt, Home and Design Editor at Lux Interiors and Design Magazine, and I'm honored to moderate tonight's conversation. It's a stormy evening here on the East Coast, so I hope everyone tuning in has their feet kicked up and their drink of joy in hand. It's going to be a great hour together. Um, so, you know, <laughs> Hampton has visions of shingled salt boxes spring to mind. But another vernacular defined Long Island architecture for decades, specifically from the late 50s to the late 80s when the Hamptons, now established as a moneyed beachside playground, became a nexus for brave modernist design. And as such, hiding behind the hedges throughout the East End are architectural treasures by the likes of Richard Meyer, Andrew Geller, Norman Jaffe, Meyer and Henry Goldfinger, and so many others. So while some of these historic homes have been lovingly cared for and re-inspirited over the years, with little protections in place, countless others have been raised for the newer and the bigger. So that's why we're here today in support of Timothy Godbald's initiative to do something about it, to acknowledge these buildings and action awareness for their preservation. And we are so lucky to be joined by an incredible, robust panel of experts on the subject, each of whom brings a unique perspective to the conversation. So here today is Alistair Gordon. I'm gonna go around and introduce all our panelists quickly and then we will dive into the program. So Alistair is an award-winning critic, curator, cultural historian and author. For more than 20 years, he wrote on architecture, art and the environment for the New York Times. And in 2008 became contributing editor on design for WSJ, the Wall Street Journal magazine, as well as launching the popular wall-to-wall -wall design blog on the journal's website. Gordon's essays have been published in many other publications, including Architectural Digest, House and Garden, and Dwell. In addition to his critical journalism, Gordon has published more than 28 books, including Weekend Utopia, Architectonica, Romantic Modernist, and Wandering Forms. Welcome, Alistair. Thank you. We are also joined today by Bruce Nagel. Bruce is a managing partner of Bruce Nail and Partners Architects with offices in West Hampton Beach and Chicago. He received his Bachelor of Architecture degree from the University of Texas at Austin mm -hmm. <laughs> and his Master of Architecture from the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. Nagel has worked on many celebrated projects such as the Fenwell Hall Marketplace Project while at Benjamin Thompson and Associates in Cambridge, Mass as project architect for several residential and institutional projects with Richard Meyer and partners, and a senior associate at Guathme Siegel and Associates, where he worked on numerous public and private award-winning projects. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you. Next, we have David Netto. David is a Los Angeles-based interior designer and writer. He's worked as a contributing design editor to the Wall Street Journal, T, the New York Times Style Magazine, and now writes the case studies column for Town and Country. Recently, David authored a monograph on the works of Francois Catreau and is presently at work on two new books, one of his own designs and another on the work of Stuart Bills. 
David Netto is now active in LA with projects on both East and West Coasts, and recently the Bahamas, London, and Arizona. Thanks for being here, David. Thank you, Grace. Next, say hello to Ellen Saltzman. Ellen is a born and raised New Yorker who spent time in East Hampton since 1944. A graduate of Smith College, she worked in fashion for 55 years, including as fashion editor at Glamour Magazine and fashion director and VP at Saks Fifth Avenue. Uh, the fashion director? Yes, I was. <laughs> and um, is, oh, the, you seem to have, my, my picture seems to be lost though. We'll get you back, Ellen, no worries. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen and her late husband, interior designer, Rennie B. Saltzman purchased three acres of potato field in East Hampton and built Saltzman House alongside the then young architect, Richard Meyer in 1969. <laughs> she still lives there happily with her son, daughter-in-law and grandsons. Welcome Ellen and thank you. We will get your face back here momentarily. <laughs> That's okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Next, uh, Jeff Gaiman joins us. Jeff is a former resident of Wayne Scott, an arts journalist and the author of the memoir, The Kingdom of the Kid, Growing Up in the Long Lost Hamptons, which includes a chapter on the 1969 Stone Saltbox Farmhouse in Wainscott that Norman Jaffe designed for Harold Becker, the photographer and film director, which I believe he may be speaking about later in the program. Thank you and welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Grace. Next up, we have Sarah Coots. Sarah is Preservation Director at Preservation Long Island, where she provides advocacy support for initiatives in communities throughout Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk counties. Sarah is an archeologist, anthropologist, and historian with 20 years of experience in academia, as well as the public and private sectors, and has directed investigations of cultural and historical resources in New York, Chicago, New Orleans, and the Southeastern United States. So welcome, Sarah. And last, but certainly not least, we have Maureen Erb. Maureen is a restoring and renovating realtor of properties in Los Angeles, Pasadena, and Palm Springs. After doing several of her own projects, Herb, an award-winning branding designer, turned her passion for architecture into her full-time focus. Devoted to preservation and education, Maureen is committed to matching people to the right properties. She serves as on the board of directors of Palm Springs Modernism Week and curates the online signature home tours. Welcome, Maureen. And again, a big thank you to all of our panelists for being here. And we are about to dive in. So to open things up, I'd really like to start with Alistair. Um, I'd love if you could kind of situate our audience this evening. You know, you've been championing and writing about these homes for decades. And let's start with like the basics. Why are all these fascinating, quizzical, modernist homes, what are they doing on Long Island? And why are they so important? That's a good question. Uh, it's a long answer, but I'll try to keep it short. The, <laughs> um, the, the main reason there's a sort of a legacy of experimental architecture on Long Island, Eastern Long Island is that, you know, it goes back to before World War II, but it certainly really culminates after the war with artists coming out like Jackson Pollock and Robert Motherwell. And that's to me what was so interesting uh, back in the 80s and early 90s of discovering all these forgotten houses that it wasn't just that they were modernist in, in nature and they were small footprint, but that they had this other incredible legacy of being associated often with a well-known artist of the period, like the Motherwell House, which he designed with Pierre Chirot, you know, arguably one of the you know greatest French designers ever, and Bob Motherwell being one of the really top, you know, abstract expressions of that period. And then you had Peter Blake, um, who's who had come here from Europe uh, as a young architect. He met Jackson Pollock, and the first time he met him, he went into the studio in Springs and just it kind of blew his mind. And he said at that moment that that was his inspiration for, di for discovering a new kind of American architecture that was as energized and as American as, as Pollock's you know, paintings on the floor were. And it goes on and on. You had Le Corbusier coming out, staying with the, the Nivolas, painting murals in their house. Tino Nivola, who's a great Italian artist of the period, making a garden with Bernard Rudofsky, uh, who's a famous Viennese theorist. Um, Frederick Kiesler was here making his, his first models of the endless house. I mean, it was really this kind of dynamic incubator uh, for, for experimental ideas. And the, the important part to me was the crisscrossing of the art world and architecture. And it, that doesn't always happen that often. I mean, it obviously does. And whenever it does, it's, it, it ends up being a very interesting result. But that, that to me was, and then you go into the, um, 
the 60s with Charlie, you know, I think the generation that's better known was Charlie Guathme, Richard Meyer, Barbara Nesky and Julian Nesky, who did more than one house. You know, they did quite a lot of houses out there and sure. uh, that really made a difference. But, but, you know, when I started looking into this, it was the peak of postmodernism. The real estate kind of narrative was that these are just junky things from the 50s or the 40s, just knock them down. They're too small, build something bigger. So th that's what I was facing then was just to, you know, just trying to argue that these are incredibly important historical artifacts that are very much about the place. And really? counter narrative to what, what the real estate people were saying, which is, you know, build a big neo shingle style kind of manor house and pretend you're English gentry, you know? So that, so I, I grew up in a tiny beach house with my parents in Amagansett. So it was something very personal from the beginning. Absolutely. And I just, yeah, having even that baseline context is so important because it situates us and gives a, a sense of the significance behind these homes, right? And, you know, I we've kind of touched on it, but, you know, what do you think we can really learn from these houses? What do you think are kind of like the biggest, the biggest establishing tenets that, you know, kind of remain unchanged? To me, the most important, and it's something Andrew Gellero said to me, was, you know, it a house should only take 10%, maybe 15% of the, the overall lot. And I think that's a great rule of thumb. And of course, what yeah. happened starting in the 80s, 90s, and the oddies, you know, was everybody, you know, maxed out to the very limit of the building envelope. And that's one thing. Also, with the modern house, you know, as any architect knows, you can if you can be site specific you know you can make it up as you go and you're relating directly to nature and to the views and to you know if you're lucky to be on the ocean or on a, on a you know a inlet or something you can direct all the attention towards that aspect of nature you can put a window wherever you want if you're doing neo-historical uh, style of architecture you can't you don't have that freedom you know you're, you're constantly constrained by kind of trying to make a pastiche of some kind of historical moment so yeah. but I, I think the less is more the small foot you know I wish we could go back to just a small footprint I mean I grew up in a beach house that was I think 800 square feet and we had bunk beds and it <laughs> was you. It was heaven, it was paradise. It was and you were on the beach all day, so it didn't matter. So. Yeah, and I think it is an interesting moment to talk about that. I mean, we've actually seen this a lot at the magazine, but I feel like there is this moment of people being much more conscious about the footprint of their home and perhaps downsizing or having, you know, ancillary buildings instead of this, you know, one focal structure. And I do think there's something about the scale of these homes that is very relevant, you know, to what people want now. And I think that's kind of actually a good segue to move over to Bruce, who I know has, you know, worked on, built additions, restored, uh, you know, several of these homes, if not more. And I'd kind of like to get your take, you know, on then and now, if you will, you know, what were clients asking for kind of at the time of the genesis of these homes that is different than what you were hearing today, but what is still the same? In other words, what, you know, what kind of makes them contemporary? Uh, uh, thanks, Grace. Um... One of the luxuries or advantages that <clears throat> I have had is I've been here in the Hamptons for 40 something years um, and have had the experience of working with clients that were closer to things that were being asked for in these early modern houses. Um, the, I think the big difference between then and now is what Alistair touched on, which is size. There's, there's such a emphasis being placed on having bigger is better. And when people like an Andrew Geller was designing houses, it was really more about the positioning of the piece of architecture on a property, its relationship to the property, its views, and the Biggest difference is that there was a freedom. There was a freedom even in the in our culture at in that 50s, 60s time. Yeah. People were, you know, experimenting, experimenting, you know, the, the simple things to talk about is people were experimenting with drugs. I mean, they were spending time <laughs> in coffee houses and you know in, in the village and listening to 
Bob Dylan and all kinds of interesting new kinds of ways to interpret music. Um, and therefore those people were also exploring and thinking about different ways to have a life. Um, sure. And people like an Andrew Geller or Norman Jaffe or whomever was being given an opportunity to reflect these kind of new attitudes about life and not thinking about having the big mansion and Saturday night going down to Maidstone Club and having dinner and having their whole social life around some pretense. And, uh, you know, these houses that were done in that period, you know, I, I, I have to always remind people, there was no LIE. You didn't drive from New York to the Hamptons in 1950. There was no LIE until 1955. And it didn't even extend to Riverhead until 1970. So when people came here, they were coming here to get away and really get away. Um, and they enjoyed being in their houses. They spent huge amounts of time outside of their house, enjoying the landscape, the beach, walking in nature. It was just a different attitude about life. Today, we design houses that are, you know, precious, covered with marble and people taking off their shoes when they walk in so that they don't dirty the floor. Um, yeah. it's, it's just a whole different attitude about how people perceive themselves. It's not really about architecture, it's about people. Um, and so I think there's a huge difference there, Sarah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I think, I think that's super interesting, but it also makes it, you know, part of the reason it's so specific to the beach house, you know, vibe being such a well-suited kind of match there. And, you know, I mean, you've, you've talked a lot about the, you know, the way of life, the lifestyle, connecting with nature, having this kind of barefoot casual, um, you know, mood that's quite different than the Hamptons of today. But, um, you know, kind of from just a, a style point of view, an expressive point of view, I mean, you touched on it with the, with the music and the drugs, but they are kind of, interesting, strange, beautiful, but strange, you know, forms often. And I kind of did want to get your take on that, just, you know, in terms of kind of some of the angularity and the fenestration, like, what do you think that ultimately was reflecting? Well, I think, it, again, you know, I'm, I know that Alistair and I share the same point of view about this. I mean, architecture is just a reflection of social norms and, mm -hmm. you know, where people are. They all, it also was a very reflective thing of what people's budgets were. I mean, they weren't spending a lot of money for these houses. They, these things were thrown up cheaply. But yeah. what was really being focused on was being inventive with forms and shapes and window orientations. I mean, again, I remind people that in 1950, you know, we didn't have big folding doors and sliding things that were 40 or 50 feet long. You were lucky to walk out a door to go to the beach that was three feet wide. Um, and uh, so, you know, the orientation of things, like where did you put that window to look out at the, the, the nice field that your house was next to, was more important than whether or not it had, a, you know, palladium and a window somewhere. Um, yeah. And so it was a, a very free spirited kind of interchange between the client and the architect. You know, these clients wanted these things. They, this didn't just happen because of the genius of the architect to go, that's critical. What was happening is you had a client that was trying to push the envelope even about their own life. Absolutely. And that's what makes it so interesting. And I love that money word of exciting because that's what I think these homes are. And that's kind of, I would actually like to go over to David and get your take on the word exciting and, um, you know, kind of tackling the interiors of these homes for the 21st century. You know, you're, as our resident designer, um, I would I would love to get your take there. You know, it's a unique aesthetic, right? And um, how can we kind of inspire today's buyer to get behind that? And you know, are there are there do's and don'ts when it comes to, you know, kind of restoring, reconceiving the interiors of these homes so that they feel contemporary? I just I kind of like to get your take on all that. Well, of course, 
it's my luck to go after Bruce, who talked about drugs, because I had my entire response built around um, the, the theme <laughs> of drug use in, in these houses, and now I don't know what Quite I all right. <laughs> I, um, I, uh, I, I love what, what um, Bruce said, but what, what you just asked me is how can you make these houses relevant to young, younger buyers? You know, but that implies how can you make them relevant to young rich people today? Because the, the market is now a certain kind of affluent house buyer who wants more opulence than a lot of these um, uh, quite Spartan beach houses had to offer. And one thing that, um, I'll, I'll sort of answer your question in two parts. One thing that, that helps, there's momentum in favor of preserving A-frame stuff and, and, and modernism um, from the 50s and 60s in that more than ever, now everybody wants to live like a surfer, no matter how much money you have. I find <laughs> that the client that used to be the enemy of modernism, because the more money you had, the more you wanted it to look like, something grand, you know, that had always been there, those people, um, you know, private equity or whatever it is they do, I can't understand what it is, but I wish, <laughs> I, wish I could get out so I could try to do it. Um, those people now want to be surfers. And so I never really saw that coming and, and, and turning into some kind of reappraisal for uh, modern houses that is organic and very much underway. And I live in um, the eastern part of Amagansett, you know, as it becomes Montauk in a house on stilts that's a hexagon that I never thought any of my clients would respect or be very interested in, since not many of them, you know, are so bohemian um, or want to live that way. And everybody loves that house on stilts. So that's sort of recent, I'd say, in the last five to 10 years, and that's helpful. Um, the other thing that you can do to, um, Sort of get get people to value what the, the the good modernism was really about is use decorating to make it look cool and one of the nicest things i mean i try to do that no matter what i'm handed but um you know one of the nicest things i've seen recently that sort of blew the top of my head off because i was not used to thinking of it as distinguished architecture was visiting tom shearer's new apartment at um um Dune Alpen in, in Wainscott, which was, I don't even know the, the name of the architect, but it was a development by Tina Fredericks. And mm -hmm. it's sort of quasi utopian, semi detached, you know, everything out of fashion now from the 70s. And he made it look so cool with Saren and, you know, furniture like a tulip table and a giant um, mm -hmm. Gucci paper globe and sprayed it all white, you know. So, so good decorating actually does sell the idea of living that way afresh yeah and then yeah. the thing i mean just i said i would answer in two parts but the thing that 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 is the third thing is there are some very very distinguished houses that are big and can hold anybody out here which are modern and um ellen saltzman's is in my opinion the very best of that you know thank norman, you norman <laughs> norman has become uh you know very much prized by people that can build anything they want or have anything they want so there's a third category where you feel the sand between your toes, but there are these, these quite big scale houses that are every bit as sexy as the small houses like Ellen's. And, and those aren't going anywhere, one hopes. Yeah, thank you, David. And that was a perfect uh, passing of the torch to Ellen, whose take I would really love to get on this as well. You know, you live in such a treasure, such an incredible home. Um, and I wanted to ask you, you know, kind of when you're talking about your home, what you love about it, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, having lived there for, you know, over the past several decades, what do you say? Like, what are the best parts about living in a home such as yours, you know, from a lifestyle point of view, and then just also in terms of, you know, the beauty surrounded by you? Like, how would you message your home to somebody who doesn't quite understand the vibe? Well, our house is 4,000 square feet. It's small. And it was built for myself, my husband, and two children. And it was built as a family house. And it is still a family house. My children have been married. I mean, my children who now who've grown up here got married here. It's it's yeah. a, it's a fa it's all a family. My grandchildren come out every weekend to be with us. Um, it's totally a, a way a family way of living. And Richard 
worked with my husband who was an interior designer. So the combination of the two of them was quite fantastic. Um, it, there, were war, there were times of war because my husband wanted a red <laughs> kitchen. Richard wanted a white kitchen, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it, um, it just, it's a happy home. It's always been a happy home. We've never had to, we've never thought of moving. We've never thought of selling, fortunately. Um, and we were lucky enough to build one house off the beach. So when Jim Amadon, who is a real estate agent, showed us the house, he said, stand on top of your car. And we stood on top of the car and there was the beach. And, <laughs> and that's when you were sold. And we were sold. <laughs> have you had, I mean, you, you know, having such an iconic home, have you had people kind of tracing across your lawn trying to get a piece? Have you had oh, any? We absolutely. And fortunately, we now have deer fences up so they can't get in. But <laughs> yes, I mean, they used to come all the time. And then there were people that came and said, why don't you move that piece of machinery? Wow. And what was your response to them? Um, get off my lawn. Uh, my, I give him my finger, actually. <laughs> good for you. Um, you know, I, that's kind of a good parlay to Jeff. Uh, you, of course, grew up in the area as well. Um, and, you know, these homes are quite personal to you. You've written a book about it. Um, you know, I kind of like to get your take on, you know, maybe one or two that are really important to you, you know, to your memory that stand out. I would like to ask you about a home that is still around, but I would also like if you could share any that are no longer here with us, because that is kind of the underlying thread here. Well, I, uh, the first house style kind of house I fell for hard was the salt box. You all know that the uh, South Fork, the East End is one of the capitals of salt boxes in the world, along with Cedar. Did we lose Jeff? Yep, something happened. <laughs> the storm is rolling through and we're losing people. We'll come back to Jeff, um, but I see Sarah has joined us and I know you have lots to say on the subject as well. Um, you know, we were just about to kind of talk about some of the homes that are no longer here, right? And that's what I wanna ask you about. How can we fight for these homes so we don't lose more of them? You know. I'm kind of talking at a really baseline level, you know, what are some of the most actionable ways that the community can rally together to have historic designations placed? You know, kind of in simplest terms, where do we begin and what can the every woman do? Thank you. It's a great question. And th thanks so much to the library and um, everyone for having me. Um, of course. So this is a, a question I get a lot every day as a, um, <laughs> The preservation director of Preservation Long Island, and um, I work. I work mainly in Nassau and Suffolk, but I do sometimes wander off into the western end of Long Island. But um, these kinds of buildings, as everyone has saying, has has you know uh, expressed, are insanely important. They're they're very important. Some of them are designed by really incredibly uh, influential and world class architects. Um, so how do you protect them? The same way you protect the 18th century <laughs> colonial structures. Um, a historic structure is a historic structure. Um, the content is a little different for 20th century modernism, but <laughs> ultimately the tools, the laws, the processes, those are all the same. So, um, you know, any of the old colonial buildings that are protected by landmarking and listed on the National Register, same process for modernist buildings. Um, so how, how do you do that? Um, I want to emphasize that listing on the National Register of Historic Places is different, very different than local landmark designation. Um, local landmark designation is a municipal designation, it comes from your village or your town. And that is sort of like a zoning designation. Um, historic designation is meant to be, you know, to have some teeth in it, where it's protecting these buildings as resources of the community for the future of the community moving forward. Um, so if there's a, a somebody who wants to dem demolish or uh, do some intensive changes, 
a lot of that would come under the architectural review board anyway in most of the East End. But if you're dealing with a historic designated property, there would be a little bit of an extra look at that property. And it's also protected from things like demolition um, because it's a historic resource. It's meant to you know, last because this thing is part of the community. It tells a story about the community. And um, my colleagues have sort of shared the story of modernism, where it came from, the mm -hmm. folks involved, why people started building these houses on the East End. That's part of the story of the East End, just as much as the colonial period or the 19th century whaling period. Um, it's just now kind of coming into its own. Most people regard uh, 50 years old as historic. So a lot of these buildings are 50 years old now when, and a lot of the rest of them are gonna get there really soon. Um, yeah, so, that was my question because I know there are protections extended to these, you know, old centuries old homes, but I did know that you know you did have to have a certain age to be considered. Um, so it's fifty years, not not one hundred. That's for the national register. For the local designations, it's much broader. Municipalities, especially in the state of New York, where home rule—that's uh, local governments—have a lot of power. They have a lot of. Um, uh, discretion in their designations. They don't have to follow the same guidelines necessarily in terms of designation as the National Register does, because it's something very different. It's a different kind of process. It's a different tool. It's a different law. It's, it's just a different kind of um, protection for the thing. And interestingly enough, a lot of people are very surprised that National Register listing does not protect a building from demolition or any kind of changes that, um, uh, oh, I have a chat popping up. Oh, we can get oh, to yes. that at the end of the program. No <laughs> yeah, um, yes, yes, these are really threatened because they don't have these designations. Um, National Register listing can open doors to great financial incentives. Uh, National Register is sort of like the carrots. <laughs> There's a lot of tax credits, grants, different kinds of things, and also just recognition. So, uh, you know, the plaques, have, everybody's seen the, this house right. is listed on the National Register. Um, and that's a great way for communities to celebrate these resources and, you know, raise awareness. And some municipalities will give things like tax abatements or tax credits to owners of historic properties. Um, a lot of the municipalities on the East End do have this sort of tool available. And that's meant to help folks uh, invest in the rehabilitation and the repairs of these kinds of buildings. Yeah. And you know, you can imagine in a colonial building, you have different kinds of challenges, you know, cedar shake roof, that's a different kind of challenge. The uh, you know, the, the the windows with the the different panels of glass and the wood. Um, but in these modernist buildings, there's different kinds of challenges for long-term preservation. Uh, it's, Interesting. It's, it's just a different kind of approach. Kind, again, the, the process, the tools are the same, the content's gonna be different. And um, it, it's a, so some recently designated National Register Historic Districts and listings, um, the Sands community in Sag Harbor is a mid-century subdivision with lots of different varied, very vernacular, not the high sort of, um, uh, with, with the, the, the named architects, but more of a vernacular. However, there was uh, an architect involved, at least one, and she was very important. She was a founder in the 1940s. That's a Maisily Meredith. And I'm sure folks on the East End have heard her name. She is the earliest known practicing black woman architect in the United States. Um, so that's really amazing. And that community chose mid-century modern style. Um, it might not have been, you know, a Jaffe or, or uh, uh, one of the other well-known modernist architects, but it was in the style. And a lot of the houses did mimic um, the sorts of, uh, right shapes and forms that, that my colleagues were talking about. So um, I just wanna share a couple of links in the chats 
That would be great. Um, and everyone can kind of check that out on the back end. Thank you. Um, oh, you're so welcome. And uh, so, so I have additionally, um, I wanted to mention that modernist design in historic context is also incredibly important. And I'm sitting here at um, the Milneck School for the Deaf, which is in Milneck, the village of Milneck on the North Shore of Nassau County. And this is a Tudor, Tudor revival style uh, country house, Gilded Age estate. It was built in the 1920s. In the 1940s, it was sold to um, the Episcopal, an Episcopal group who, who worked with the deaf, educating the deaf and hard of hearing. And ever since the 1940s, the whole estate has been used for educating the deaf and hard of hearing. And the first buildings that were ever built after the initial kind of Gilded Age period were two really interesting uh, modernist style buildings from the 60s and 70s uh, done by a firm based in New York City and Garden City. So, um, you know, you can use modernist design to, to expand um, uses and different kinds of uh, rehabilitation of older historic properties that you might not expect. Another great example of that approach is uh, John Germain Library in Sag Harbor, where it has the modernist um, style addition off the back. Um, so it, they can sort of live happily together, even on the same property. And another great example <laughs> is uh, Preservation Long Island. Um, it's it's uh, one of our endangered historic places along with the Sands District, uh, the Brooks Park property in the Springs community. Mm -hmm. and. Um, James Brooks and Charlotte Park were a, a abstract expressionist couple artists who were very good friends with um, Jackson Pollock, Lee Krasner, and, and the sort of Abex crowd that came out here um, to, to live. And um, their compound uh, where they lived, 11 acres, has um, on it uh, an array of sort of traditional looking, you know, houses, but then we also have this really wonderful studio that James Brooks built himself in a really cool modernist style. So modernism isn't something different, it's it's in there, you know? Um, I love your enthusiasm, Sarah, and please do send around those links to the group because I know everybody would want to check out those in particular. Just, just one more thing that, that <laughs> I have to, um, I have to put out a call to the community, especially anybody who lives in the village of Southampton, there is a Norman Jaffe designed house uh, at 88 Meadow that is um, on the agenda for the next meeting of the Sag Harbor, or Sa Sag Harbor, the Southampton Architectural Review Board, which is uh, coming up in, in August. And that house is being proposed for demolition and it is not protected from demolition because it's not a contributing resource of the historic district, even though it is in the historic district. So um, if anybody is in the village listening now and, and wants to, to get engaged and like you said, Grace, do something to protect these, these, these buildings, yeah. this is a great example. So I, I'll send some links in the chat and if folks would like to do that, please do it. Great. This is great. how we save things. The community Fantastic. comes forward. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, and yeah, and, you know, kind of just to be our celebratory note before I pose the same question to you all, I wanted to move over to Maureen. Um, so kind of something that Tim has talked about, and I know kind of like a pie in the sky wish for Hampton's 20th Century Modern would be to see a program like Palm Springs Modernism Week adopted for the Hamptons. And that would be a really great way to get people super excited about these homes to elevate the profile. Um, and I wanted to ask Maureen, you know, kind of from her experience, what would be the most kind of like easy implement things to do here, whether that's lectures or, you know, having people like Ellen open their doors, um, you know, Maureen, what would kind of, what would be your best advice kind of first steps to get something like that off the ground? Maureen? Maureen, you're muted. <laughs> First step would be to unmute. 
<laughs> there we go. Sorry, here I am. <laughs> um, well, I think you're off to a great start. Um, outreach is so important, and it really is about communicating to people the importance of um, saving these homes and connecting with people who are um, passionate about these homes. A lot of people don't even know these homes exist. And so that's the first education is really the first um, step. Uh, Modernism Week started as a very grassroots program. Um, it was uh, sandwiched between two architecture and design events in Palm Springs um, back in 2006. And uh, a group of people that really wanted to spread the word about the importance of architecture and the architects of Palm Springs decided to do a few events in between these other two um, events and did some home tours, lectures. Um, and it was a time when the architects of some of these uh, properties were still around. So they were there to tell stories. And little by little every year, this event would happen. And now it's grown into an international event. Um, the architecture of Palm Springs is known throughout the world now. Um, every year, uh, people come to Palm Springs for Modernism Week, which is now an 11 day event uh, mm -hmm. with over 350 events. Uh, we raise money for preservation. We raise money for um, the city of Palm Springs and the whole Coachella Valley. We raise money for scholarships. And it really started just the same way. Um, getting uh, properties registered is, of course, very, very important, not just to have them registered, but it really gives an aura of importance to the architecture. And uh, it, it resonates with people and people who are interested in this sort of architecture then learn about it and become passionate to want to try and save the architecture, learn about the architecture. Home tours are everyone's favorite thing. People love to go into the homes. They love to meet the homeowners, Ellen, and learn about your stories, um, how you came to design a house like this, how you live in a house like this. And if you I've, I've, done renovations, I've often shown us the house. <laughs> I've, we've been on several house tours, so. And that is so generous of homeowners who do that because people love to get into these houses and see how people like yourselves live in them. And not everybody is so generous. So anyone who opens their house to a house tour, it just um, it attracts like-minded people like yourselves and it inspires them to do the same thing. It inspires them to try and find a home that might be even very modest for they themselves to restore. Um, and that's such an important thing. Um, as you know, there are people who are just passionate about these properties. And the more that they are educated and aware of how they can become part of the movement is very inspiring to people. Um, outreach again is so important, lectures, home tours, reaching out to the press, um, social media, books, documentaries, uh, connecting with partner organizations um, so you can share audiences and share what you're doing with like-minded people. And you guys are doing a great job at this already. Um, and as I said, just like Modernism Week, it will continue to grow as the words the word gets out there and the word continues to spread, you'll attract more like-minded people who are attracted to um, to getting part, to becoming part of it. Absolutely. Thank you, Maureen. Well, you'll have to be our, our sensei to guide us through this when we get this off the ground. Um, and I think, you know, that's actually a great segue into our round robin. I kind of wanted to wrap everything up by asking you all the same question. Obviously, we're a big group and we can't banter. Or everybody would be screaming over Zoom at each other. But um, I'll call on each of you. And I really just wanted to get one piece of advice um, from each of you. So kind of the most effective long term solution here, you know, is probably getting young, wealthy people flocking to the Hamptons excited about these homes and wanting to buy them and caretake them, right? So how do we do that? <laughs> That's a million dollar question. So um, kind of in a few sentences, I'd like if you could each share a bright idea you have. You know, I know Timothy had discussed 
like a designated annex for the architecture of the Hamptons at you know one of our one of the great museums out east. So I'd love to go around get each of your thoughts on one thing that could be really great. Uh, let's start with Alistair. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's you know like everybody's been saying, it's it, the only way to increase awareness is to have programs like this, exhibitions. We used to do a series that was called Bozark, where we did house tours, which sold out like crazy, exhibitions, award programs, all of that stuff. And, and I, you know, as much as I'd like to believe a public policy could help, with the, with the prices of real estate out there, it's so much about private incentive that you kind of, you know, as I think David said, you kind of have to make it cool and, and seduce them into, you know, whether it's a surf shack or whatever, which is a great idea, you know, just make it, it's really, it's really about publishing more, more material and, and exhibitions and things like this, you know, and, and that's the only, because, because it's, you know, the public policy has, to be honest with you, has never really worked. And every time there's a smaller house that's in danger and someone who's clueless and doesn't want it, wants to knock it down, they do. It's, it, it's, we've never won from the other side ever, as far as I know. And I've been doing this since 1986. So, you know, you really have to rely on the seduction of media, I, I think. <laughs> yes, and that, that falls on me a bit. And I, I mean, I, he will remain unnamed for this conversation, but I was actually just saw a home of a designer who's a very, very traditional designer, you know, kind of very opulent, very traditional, living in a 1970s, super cool, petite house, painted all black, um, I feel like maybe there's something there, at, you know, designers or architects who love these homes doing their thing and making them amazing is actually, you know, and then, and then publishing them in Lux is, is you're saying you think kind of the best strategy. Yeah. Or books or exhibitions. I, I don't, I don't know about magazines, but yeah, just attention. That's, that's, yeah. Really what it's gonna, I hate to say it because I'd much rather, I'd much rather believe that the town of East Hampton, the town of Southampton, could, could legislate, you know, some very strict rules about re the review process, but it's so hard to get that, that education into that process, which is already complex. I mean, Bruce knows this better than anyone. You know, it's, it's a harrowing, yeah. difficult, long process to then have some expert who actually knows it. I've served on a lot of those committees and they kind of just roll their eyes. You know, you, you say this is historically incredibly, like the Muschenheim house is in Hampton Bays. No one could have cared less. This is the, one of the first modernist houses in America and it was torn down, you know, like 15 years ago, whatever. So it's, it's, it's you really have to just bang the drum, you know, and make it pop, a popular movement the way Palm Springs did it so well. Bang the drum, I like it. I'm talking yeah, Bruce, house. you're up. Um, one of the things that Alistair just mentioned was in the 80s, we used to have these uh, Bozart uh, presentations, call them, uh, present, uh, you know, round robin, robin discussions. We had a uh, table of, of no, noted architects, uh, even sometimes they included me. And, uh, and we would talk about architecture in an open, you know, free-flowing way where we were really able to educate the public like Maureen is talking about. You know, you really have to educate people. You can't just start. I can tell you as a practicing architect in the Hamptons for 40 years, one of the biggest challenges, though I know Alistair is concerned about the demo, but when I've worked on houses that were done by famous architects, let's say the Neskis, these houses don't have proper infrastructure. They have poor electrical services. They have no good heating or air conditioning, sometimes no air conditioning and no place to put it. They have things that don't meet safety codes like glass or handrails or whole bunches of crap. And today, you know, they would never pass these environmental codes that we have to have for insulation, and all this. So it's not only educating a group of, let's say, planners or people that are kind of bureaucrats. You also have to educate a building department that won't make you totally destroy one of these houses to make it safe. Yeah. It's really devastating to these pieces of architecture. Anyway. Good point. <laughs> and David, uh, I'd like to hear your take. What's, 
what are your thoughts on kind of elevating the profile here? Um, I gave you my best shot, which was making it cool, making it look cool. It's already cool, but making more people think that it's cool. And um, I don't want to come on here and not offer something optimistic as the main message, but I would, I would say two things. I would say um, that the beautiful houses from the turn of the century in East Hampton are not protected either in large measure. Mm -hmm. And you drive up and down Lily Pond Lane and terrible things are happening. And you know, when $30 million changes hands for a lot, nobody cares because they're gonna do what they wanna do. And, and I have benefited in my career from some of that, but I think what I'm getting at is East Hampton has to find a way to legislate its way to decide what kind of town we are to be. You know, is it just going to be um, an unregulated playground for people that can do anything they want to, to you know, to have the architecture entirely um, survive at their whim? Or do you look at another place that survived or, or has sustained an, a, an avalanche of money on it, like Aspen, Colorado, you know, and, and with his very, very strict building codes. I mean, you know, I, I, I actually am in favor of making it cool, but also of there being some kind of legislation to protect because I don't think there's any way to stop it if we don't get that um, uh, instated. And, um, and I'm not saying I'm optimistic about it either, but the nicest thing is to be invited to a conversation like this where, where you see how much people care about it. Okay. I, I, I would also add to what Bruce just said, with the woes of preserving um, these modernist buildings that if they haven't been maintained, it's really impossible to bring them back as a restoration project. It's almost a reconstruction project. And I know this from my own life in a Neutra house in Los Angeles um, and seeing how that goes. So we have each other, we can hold each other. <laughs> these are some of the challenges. Yeah. I'm like, Ellen, you gotta have something more optimistic for me. <laughs> No. We have Ellen and we have her house, and that is a beacon. In the exactly. But I will say the maintenance is the, I mean, to try to keep it up is incredible. Well, you're succeeding. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. And, right. and I care. <laughs> and Ellen, did you have an idea you wanted to share with us? Or it sounds like you have graciously opened your doors in the past. Would you be, would you be on board for Hampton's Modernism Week in some form? Of course I would be. Of course I would be. Love it, thank you. Um, and Jeff, I'm so sorry we lost you earlier. I don't know if you're getting those storms out there, but you had some terrific ideas you sent me and I'd love to hear your take. I will give you three ideas. One is an exhibit of buildings that don't exist. Uh, exhibit to take place at let's say Guild Hall or the Parish Art Museum and subjects uh, you know, include Robert Motherwell's studio in East Stanton. But one of my favorites was the Andrew Geller um, Betty Reese A-frame that was uh, built in Sagaponic and destroyed by the 1962 storm. And uh, I love the story that Geller uh, convinced the um, uh, town of Southampton engineers to get away with an A-frame because he said, what's a potato farm but an A-frame? And they, they bought it. So uh, that's an exhibit. Number two, idea number two, is an app linked to um, signs all around the Southport, uh, yeah. designating um, existing and non-existing buildings. My favorite one of all time, people know a lot about this, on Town Line Road between Sagaponic and Wainscott, on the Wainscott side is Norman Jeff, who's great stone, salt box fortress, sailing ship for Harold Becker, the movie director, Sea of Love, Taps, 1969, I watched it being built, stone by stone, great piece of work, silhouette from the road, uh, you know, a soapbox roof line, a gable topping off at uh, 30 feet, which is a fireplace, uh, one door, no window, seven foot high door um, going down to a fence that runs 50 feet. It's a great landmark. It just stuns still today. The third idea, and I, I hope I get a laugh about this, is to have a round robin, a panel discussion, again, a guild hall or parish art museum with residents of buildings by one architect. Mm. And I got this idea from a guy named, um, uh, uh, a designer in California named Steve Race, who grew up in a Norman Jaffe house designed for his father, David, in Bridgehampton. 
And Steve told me last year that back in the 70s and 80s, Steve's dad, David, Alan Older, Chico Hamilton, the jazz, jazz drummer, and the sports broadcaster, Jack Whitaker, would get together at Norman Jaffe houses with Norman Jaffe and just socialize, schmooze, talk about design problems, talk about you know <laughs> idiosyncrasies. Uh, I think that'd be a terrific thing. Alan Older, he had a big you know um, uh, uh, legal uh, fallout with Norman about his house and watermill, but we'd love to hear what went down. One design flaw uh, that people and Alan can probably attest to this. These houses, uh, people live in them for a long time. They always have flaws. Harold Becker, uh, who sold in the 80s, told me that it always leaked his house on uh, Town Line Road. He went to Jaffe and said, what are you going to do about it? He said, Jaffe quoted a line from Frank Lloyd Wright to his clients who said their houses are leaked. He said, get a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my three ideas. I love it. And I, I love the idea of a salon. I think that sounds fun. Sign me up, Sarah. I can see you. I have an idea. Um, idea. And, <laughs> yeah. So what, well, I, I have to say, and I, I'm sorry, Caroline, Caroline Brodzaleski is the author of this amazing Long Island modernism book. It was published by Preservation Long Island in 2012. She worked for, for a long time on this project. And for anybody who is interested in where are these buildings um, on Long Island? Guidebook. This, this is a fabulous book. Um, thank you so much, Caroline, for doing this. And this project was, um, it came out of her and uh, Preservation Long Island's, uh, you know, we saw the need that this, these buildings were threatened, they were being demolished. And this was um, a project that was um, meant to help raise awareness show people where these things are. There's an index with all of the, oh, the architects. There's no Richard Meyer and Saltzman It's tremendous. So. Um, <laughs> so, and something oh, yeah. that came out of, of Carolyn's uh, project, Long Island Modernism, was a grassroots effort that Preservation Long Island was part of and local people um, in the community who saw the Conger Goodyear House, and I've, I've sent the link, um, which is now a uh, world monument. Um, so thanks to the efforts of Preservation Long Island and the local communities and Carolyn, um, there were literally like demolition, you know, construction machines on the property ready to knock it down. And through the advocacy of the, the local community and the nonprofit groups and, and everybody who just saw the value of this thing and the, the real, you know, threat it was facing came together World Monuments Fund showed up, and this is a fabulous example of how do we save something. So this was on the brink of being demolished, and because the community came together, because people showed up, people said, no, we don't want this, they found a way to save it. And I have to say, the laws are in place. It's just that we haven't gotten these things listed, and part of um, Carolyn's yeah. project we could, you know, just go to the uh, back in the index. We could find all of these things, see what's left, and add them to the districts, get them listed. The laws are in place locally. We have these listings. The landmark laws are in place. The tax abatement is in place. Um, I've I've shared a link to the Southampton Town um, page about the benefits of landmark. Uh, designation and included in that is tax abatements. The town will give owners of historically historic designated properties for things like uh, replacing their roof. They'll give you a certain uh, tax credit based on uh, the value of that work you're investing in. And that's meant to encourage people to, to do maintenance on their property. So those are the tools. All the tools are there. All the the, the laws are already there. It's just a matter of going to our local elected officials and asking them to look at these buildings. There hasn't been a survey of these buildings sponsored by the municipalities. So they're not on the radar. They're not a priority. That's why the community needs to come forward and let your, let your ARB, your Architectural Review Board, your Landmarks Preservation Commission, your mayor, your town supervisor, your trustees, 
let them know that this is something that you want. You want them to designate these modernist properties. They're ready, they're uh, survivors, and they're, they're part of the story now of the 20th century on Long Island. So um, please, I encourage everyone, you know, look, look up your local elected officials and, and, and show up at the office or call them or send them an email and let them know this is something that you want and that you value. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Yes. And we all have further reading to do after this. And I feel like Sarah is going to be getting a lot of emails, but thank <laughs> <My> you. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we're closing in on the hour and I want to be respectful of people's time, but Maureen, I'd love if you could take it home with an activation or an idea for us. Okay. Well, just quickly, um, my mine is less of an idea and more of a, a concept. And I think that it's all about preservation and perseverance because we win some, we lose some, and we can't give up. And it's also about connecting with the right people who love these properties. So again, it's outreach and communication because not everybody loves these properties. And it's about connecting the right people to the properties. So people who do love them and educate them to learn to love them. And I, I like David's point about um, educating people and making them aware that these are national community treasures. And once they're gone, they're gone. They're like a, an important piece of art and an important piece of vintage furniture that once it's done, it's done. So if we can make them cool, if we can create that um, PR, that was one of your words, Grace, that PR ness around them. So people really get that they're important. And then you'll get people who are moneyed and educated who want them because they are special. And I have a great story about a property we had in Palm Springs. I had a, I was selling the property and I had a buyer who was not into mid-century architecture and really just wanted an unbelievable lot, an unbelievable location. And he saw this property, the property we were selling that was by a very important architect and was an important piece of architecture, and it wasn't for him. And in looking more in Palm Springs, he came back to that lot. And as he learned about the architect and learned about the architecture, he became a great steward of the property and has restored it immaculately, is now you know, a huge fan of the architect and the architecture. And um, it's a great story. It can happen. You know, you just, um, you can't give up. Absolutely. And that is a perfect note to end on. Thank you, Maureen. And I'd like to thank all of you for your valuable time and insights. And thank you, of course, to our viewers who tuned in. If you'd like to get involved, as we discussed, there are many things to do, but please visit hamptons20thcenturymodern.com or get in touch with Timothy directly at info at timothygodball.com. All ideas are good ideas. We did a little write up on this initiative in Lux's Hamptons issue. And as Tim so eloquently said, if we build a following and we get on people's radar, anything is possible. So thank you again to our wonderful event partners, Amagansett Free Library and East Hampton Historical Society. Have a great evening, have a wonderful weekend. And I know that um, East Hampton Historical Society will be following up with some of these resources for you all. So thank you again. Thank you everybody and um, keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> thank you. Great. Have a thank good you, night. Everybody. Thank, thank you. you.